What's going on, everybody, and welcome to episode four of Eat, Speak, Compete, your favorite podcast where we go through everything going on, the latest news in esports and gaming. Joining me today, my co-host is always Shimon. He, my name is Yeso. Excited to be here once again. Had a very fun episode last week. We sat down, had a very long, very thorough discussion with uh, Zach Mazur before we kind of dive into everything we want to talk about today. Any kind of final thoughts on the discussion we got to have last week, Luke? Um, well, it was definitely my favorite episode so far. So that yeah. was pretty cool getting a chance to obviously talk with Zach. And I think that, um, you know, getting a uh, different player's point of view, mm -hmm. you know what I mean, from the from the scene is something unique that usually you don't really get to see, right? Mm -hmm. Like these players are pretty public figures who stream a lot, tweet their opinions a lot, etc. So to get to have that type of conversation with one of them, um, it's just super cool, right? You get you just kind of get a whole different perspective um from obviously the business side or the org side or whatever it might be so that was super cool i think it's a great listen if you guys haven't got a chance to listen to it yet obviously um cruise over and, and take a gander at episode three um and obviously if you guys are you know have certain you know games or genres of, of pro players you think we should reach out to and try to get one on the show and get their point of views and whatnot obviously let us know I know we've been uh, working on procuring a, a few for our next up upcoming episodes and yep. whatnot. So I, I think you guys will be excited to see some more. And um, I'm obviously excited to, uh, you know, just have more great interviews like that. Yeah, I think it was great. A lot of good insight. Uh, definitely learned some things about Zach during that show that I didn't know going in, which I think is awesome and uh, is certainly, you know, part of the purpose and the opportunity there. But let's just dive right into the news this week. And we're going to start at the top, kind of as we always do with League of Legends, one of the biggest esports in the world. And Worlds is coming up. Uh, we have set now the full 22 team lineup for the World Championship here in 2021. Uh, the kind of last results we are waiting for for a couple of regions, one of the big ones is the LPL over in China. Uh, they have had multiple world champions and now they have decided their representatives. Uh, EDG ends up winning the summer split in what was uh, actually an upset. Uh, if you guys followed it, uh, pretty much all of the analysts on the English broadcast other than one, uh, my good friend Mad Magical, uh, he was the only one predicting EDG to win. It was unanimously FPX across the board otherwise, and EG, EDG wins three to one. It's actually their first LPL title since summer of 2017, which has time. been a while. It's yeah. four years uh, for this historic org, but they win the LPL. They, along with uh, Fun Plus Phoenix, RNG, and LNG will represent China at Worlds this year, and it's looking to be like a very exciting crop of squads. I mean, they could just win the whole thing again. It wouldn't be that surprising, um, but it, you know it's going to be an interesting worlds in general. I would mm -hmm. say I'm, I'm just most interested. It's a little different. I feel like as far as like a lot of upsets this year, a lot of kind of like mixed up squads and teams. A lot mm -hmm. of people coming back that we haven't seen for a little while. Uh, it should it should turn out to be a pretty historic worlds overall. I'd say. Yeah, and I mean we've talked about it on a couple of episodes so far. Uh, no TSM at Worlds this year. Uh, no G2, which is obviously a, a huge loss. They've been one of the biggest competitors at international events over the last few years, so that is certainly historic. Uh, one thing to note, uh, if you guys have been kind of following what's going on, uh, first of all, Worlds obviously has shifted from China to Europe just due to visa issues and certain other things. Uh, Riot decided to make that change, and uh, reports coming from Dot Esports show that it's going to likely be going back to Iceland, where they hosted MSI this year, which I think is cool. I think they did a fantastic job with that event, and it pretty much went off without a hitch for the entire event, which, you know, we've talked about a couple of different things, you know, the R6 Major uh, that have dealt with issues of COVID, so it seems like Riot uh, kind of has their ducks in a row in terms of getting off a LAN event with re relatively no issues from a COVID standpoint. So it seems like they're doing everything that needs to be done to ensure that this goes off well. Um, but sadly, we won't see Vietnam at the World Championship this year. This is now the third international event that the region will miss. They ended up having to cancel uh, their summer split this year due to COVID issues. And then just due to struggles with getting visas and stuff, they had to decide that they would not uh, attend Worlds once again this year. And obviously, this is one of the most exciting regions outside of the Big Four. And it really is a shame to not see them at the biggest tournament in esports this year. Can't be that surprised. You know, it's it's obviously just an unfortunate overall circumstance. But there's so many factors just fighting against it. And, I, mm -hmm. you know, I feel like it's lucky that 
as many teams and as many regions sure. are participating are able to. You yeah. know what I mean? So obviously unfortunate, and, and hopefully we'll see him at the next split um, or the next international, if you will. But um, again, I'd, I'd say that we're just uh, we're just lucky that as many regions as many players are po- as possible, and Riot in general is able to handle the logistics of such a ludicrous land experience as mm-hmm. we've seen people fail it's great to see riot obviously one being like okay it worked let's just do it again <laughs> you yeah. know run it back same plan you know get everybody in there you know keep them safe etc so um i think it's a good choice i'm excited for um i'm excited for worlds yeah and i mean it's going to be a huge fall for riot in general right there you've got worlds coming up in october i believe it starts october 5th uh which will be immediately followed by the Valorant World Championships, which will be in November. Um, They're going to Berlin right now uh, for Masters, uh, Masters 3 for Valorant. So that's going to be a huge event that's going to decide some teams going to that World Championship. So they've got uh, a ton going on right now. And, you know, Riot as a company, I think, deserves criticism time to time. Uh, I think they've had their fair share of, of missteps. But in terms of handling... COVID and in, in handling these events the right way and keeping their staff and the players and the team staff safe. Uh, I think they deserve uh, a, a lot of praise on that front. So looking forward to all of these events. It's going to be a packed fall uh, and, you know, it, it's going to be a lot of fun esports to watch. I'm looking forward to talking about it here on the show. So. Yeah, I feel like usually and also in December, I'm just thinking maybe start thinking about all stars. Mm-hmm. Um, and like, I know, I know they'll probably run it for a league, of course, like they normally do. But mm-hmm. I'm curious, like if they'll do like an all stars for Valor in a little bit. Because, like, that could be kind of spicy. I don't think we saw that last year. Yeah, I I would be very curious to see if maybe, you know, if we don't necessarily get uh, an All-Stars type event because I don't know how that would work in terms of, I guess you could do different unique modes like Escalation and, I guess, 1v1s in that. But I would be more curious to see something akin to, uh, like, an Overwatch World Cup for Valorant get to see these teams come together of just set nationalities that aren't necessarily players that play on the same team. I think that would be something really cool that I would be interested to see from Valorant. I think that would be awesome. Um, But, you know, Riot has done all kind of different things across their esports titles, and so I would would love to see what they kind of bring to the table. I'm excited for uh, Champions. I think that's going to be an absolute banger. I'm really stoked to see because they, you know, I've been to uh, a Worlds Final for League of Legends. I've watched those esports for years, and they've you know tried to push the envelope year on year on year in terms of doing these events bigger and better Uh, and i'm very curious to see what kind of their first take on what a valorant world championship should look like dang that's super fun sounding yeah i think it's gonna be awesome (laughs) that sounds super fun i think that like the overwatch uh the overwatch world cup is always so fun to watch at Mm -hmm. blizzcon because it's like like you said it's just so different Mm -hmm. you know what i mean it's like all right what do i do let's just really get everybody fighting over it right so that was that's always super fun to see because of course the us just votes in our most popular players and everyone (laughs) else comes in with like the literally the craziest player that you've ever seen in your life so that's always super funny but um yeah i do think that uh, I'd like to see some kind of combination of All Stars or the World Cup or something mm-hmm. like that for Valorant because I think that the the fan base could utilize that for sure. Yeah, we'll circle back on some more Valorant news here in a little bit, but I want to talk Apex Legends. Uh, there was a ton of discussion last week as there were announcements made about changes to tap strafing, which is the best I can describe. Just high level movement tech on mouse and keyboard. Uh, in Apex Legends, it's something that I, I can't do. I am not that good of a player, but this is certainly something that, uh, you know, a majority of mouse and keyboard players at the top level use uh, in terms of movement tech to try and, you know, be just very slippery in fights uh, and, and, and avoid damage. Um, and a lot of mouse and keyboard players were very vocally uh, opposed to it. They felt like it lowered the skill ceiling. And one of the discussions, it kind of prompted up in the follow-up uh, as one of the de- developers at Respawn released a twit longer discussing the topic is that uh, there could be some possible changes, nerfs, adjustments to uh, aim assist on controller. This is a discussion uh, always when you have multiple different inputs for uh, a game and uh, the developers at Respawn think that there is a possibility that we could see some adjustments to aim assist in the future. Uh, One of the quotes from the 
uh, article said, uh, players should not feel forced to use a specific input type. And if I see players converting out of what they think is necessity, I would 100% be concerned. And that is from one of those developers uh, working on these things. What are your kind of thoughts here uh, in terms of possible future changes to aim assist? Yeah, I thought, I thought the tap strafing change was kind of like, was a little odd, I think, overall. I know mm -hmm. that Apex is, one has the best movement, right, of like any game in that whole yeah, I mean, genre. it's really how it's set itself apart. Yeah, it's pretty hard to, but at the same time, I feel like, I don't think this is the first time, I could be wrong, but I don't think this is the first time that they've like directly nerfed mouse and keyboard movement, which feels a little odd in general, mm -hmm. but... I don't know, it feels like the whole game is movement, so like why why keep nerfing it? But um, I don't think tap strafing was that big of a, a hitch either way. I felt like a pretty situational tech that people were utilizing in specific mm -hmm. ways, but it feels more like Octane is the issue. <laughs> right. More than it feels like tap strafing was an issue, but I don't know if that's just me, but whatever. Um, I'm not, again, I'm not a, I wouldn't say I'm a mouse and keyboard god by any means, sure. um, but it's still at the same time, I, I can't necessarily say that um, I really saw the tap strafe piece coming, especially as like isolated as it felt. But with this piece from the, the developer side, when it comes to aim assist in general, aim assist has been around pretty much since the dawn of esports with <laughs> Halo and, and Call of Duty, and you know games like Apex Legends and, and Splitgate, I'll use that as another parallel, they take their their aim assist from those games, right? True. Everybody who makes have ever made an aim assist took it pretty much from whether it be Halo or Call of Duty, whatever it might be, and kind of adjusted it from there. Now, arena shooters like Halo have a very strong, um, have an incredibly strong aim assist, mm -hmm. almost like almost like a snap lock on type thing, right? In a, in a more open universal slash cross platform game like Apex the snapping can feel pretty annoying when you can do like 360 no scope crazy stuff in that game, right? Like yeah. you're not necessarily doing that as, as often in Halo because it's a little bit more of a simplistic movement. It's really built for controller specifically, sure. right? Things like that. So maybe you can get a little bit extra like rotational speed on like a mouse and keyboard, but you're not really like completely changing the game. Yeah. I feel like the biggest problem with Apex Legends, circling back to my actual point here, is that the mobility difference between the two, like you it's like playing a different game. Mm -hmm. Right? And like when you play Halo on a mouse and keyboard or Halo on a on a controller, it's still the same game. You know, it's just like, you know, maybe you can spin around a little bit faster mouse and keyboard. You need to up your sensitivity a little bit on a on a you know a controller. But in Apex Legends it's like you got two completely separate communities utilizing completely different movement abilities and that i feel like that's what kind of makes it funky is everybody feels like someone has someone has something that they don't mm -hmm. right so i feel like we'll probably see some kind of aim assist adjustment but uh you know i, I guess i just like to see um i'd like to see more than just like oh we reduced aim assist by 15 percent yeah. Do you know what I mean? Or, oh, hey, we removed tap strafing because we're just trying to make it so controller players don't want to switch mouse keyboard and mouse keyboard players don't want to switch controller. It's yeah. like, all right, well, relax. I feel like Splitgate, as a parallel example, had like an, an opposite issue where they literally took like the Halo aim assist and they literally were like, okay, well, let's just half it. Let's just take whatever they have and we'll just like make it significantly worse. Right. And you can just kind of feel it a little bit when you play on a controller mm -hmm. that obviously playing on a mouse and keyboard in that game is significantly better yeah right it's like but it's an it's an arena shooter so it almost feels wrong so i don't know i i, I don't think there's a necessarily like full built out solution for aim assist yeah. but i think that aim assist is necessary for controller players yeah and i feel like that the the biggest issue is more around um giving all the players the same utilities regardless of what platform they're playing on yeah rather and, than making texts that are specific for them yeah I, I, it's a really it's a difficult balancing act, and this is coming from someone who has no experience or knowledge whatsoever from a developer standpoint. But like you can just tell, it's 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 a very difficult balancing act having uh, multiple kinds of inputs for these games and trying to balance them uh, as best as possible. I mean, you can look at uh, G2 right now in Apex Legends, and you know I personally consider them to be uh, one of the best teams in, in, in the world right now. They've looked incredible o over the last couple of months, and that is a team entirely made up of controller players, right? They played under the name Aim Assist prior to getting signed by G2. And, you know, I'm not going to sit here and say like, oh, they wouldn't be tops in the world if they were mouse and keyboard players. But it is interesting when the discussion comes up, as uh, this developer highlighted, that, you know, maybe some players feel like they just can't be as good on mouse and keyboard because controller is so strong. So I would say it's 
positive that uh, the developers are acknowledging these concerns from players and they're saying, hey, if we feel like this is a significant issue, we are willing to make changes. But I, I will also qualify it where uh, the, the same developer in a split longer said that the, uh, you know, both inputs have pros and cons and that uh, across really all ranks, uh, the, you know, advantages or disadvantages for the different inputs aren't as uh, aren't as big as players seem to think they are, um, which is obviously good. And, you know, certainly he's working with way more data than we have. It's just, you know, certainly more anecdotal for a lot of players, but it's, I think, going to very much be an ongoing discussion. Uh, and especially this year, considering uh, console players are going to be able to compete in ALGS, for example. Now they will compete on aim assist values for PC, which is different from the console version of the game. Um, but I think this is by no means the last time that we're going to have significant in-depth discussions about aim assist and the differences between inputs. But uh, I think it was at the very least a very interesting and, and thought provoking discussion over the last week, so. Yeah, I mean, I, I, again, I, I, don't, I don't come from a, as much of a shooter background as I do like a fighter background, right? Sure. Like in the fighting game space, it's. Everybody uses either a fight stick or a, a game pad or like a controller. And it's just comfort, really. And it's just comfort mm -hmm. piece, right? And it's the same thing with mouse and keyboard to a certain extent, right? So it's definitely a hard a hard piece to swallow, and I think that uh, I'm interested to see what else they nerf. Yeah, I'm very curious. Uh, circling back to the League of Legends World Championships, uh, we got an announcement uh, just the other day. Captain Flowers, who is uh, really has come to be the most popular play-by-play -play caster uh, in the North American region over the last few years, uh, announced that he won't be casting at the 2021 World Championship. Uh, in a quote from his twit longer, he said, I struggle a lot with the upside down schedule and just feeling super exhausted all the time. That bleeds over even after the event concludes and I end up in a downward spiral, spiral uh, of an increasingly self-destructive mental state with the current state of everything in the world that only gets more extreme. I truly believe that if I do Worlds this year, it will leave me in a really bad place in terms of being able to take care of myself and move forward with my own goals afterwards. So largely his announcement was saying, you know, he is obviously disappointed that he isn't going to do it, but feels like it is the right decision for his mental uh, and, and physical health. And I think uh, it's, you know, obviously an extremely tough decision. This is uh, a guy who has worked at the previous four world championships. Uh, he's done a world's final. He is, again, one of the most popular English uh, shoutcasters right now. And while he is not necessarily one of my favorites, uh, he has become extremely popular. And uh, I will say, you know, hats off to him for, for being able to make a tough decision like this and saying, you know, hey, my health is, is too important uh, to have it kind of turned upside down by this event. Um, what are your kind of thoughts uh, on this announcement? Uh, well, I don't really know too much about him as a person, I guess. Sure. So I don't really know if it's something that's more like I have a full time job and I do this on the side kind of thing. And if that's the case, no, it's, it's definitely like, this is what he does. hundred percent. So then in that case, then it's obviously, you know, more concerning, I guess, in that mm -hmm. sense, right? Because obviously if he, if, you know, he said like, you know, pursue his own goals afterwards, right? So I, again, I'm not, I'm not really sure what those are, you know what I mean? In that sense, or if it's more of like a personal content creator thing that he's doing or personal streaming or whatever it might be. But either way, being on air all the time and prepping for that type of like prep work that you have to do in order mm -hmm. to even like commentate an event like Worlds um, and analyze and all those kind of things. And also multiple regions, time zones, travel, it takes a certain kind of person to do all those things for mm -hmm. sure, right? So, and obviously he is one of those, yeah. but it gets to the point where, you know, if he can obviously tell that there's certain things that are more important to him than this, right, in the long term of things, and it's like, what are you going to do? You know what yeah. I mean? It's an important piece to obviously put those things first, but it's obviously, an, uh, I just think it's pretty unfortunate overall, right? Because Worlds is like the, the cultivation of everything that you work for the whole year, mm -hmm. right? And all of that knowledge that he's been putting in and effort he's been putting in the whole year is really for this specific moment mm -hmm. more than it is like anything else, right? Yeah. So unfortunate to see, like you said, it's obviously takes a lot to, to make a statement and, and Obviously, it's, it was probably a heavy pill to swallow either way for sure. him because not like he was like, nah, I don't want to cast Worlds this year, you know what I mean? Of so, course. But uh, yeah, overall, it's, it's obviously a, a bummer, and I, I would love to see you know that the talent that's grown with the scene mm -hmm. being able to you know revel in its its big events, especially like Worlds. The the thought it brought up for me was really, you know, I, I can't imagine that 
uh, Flowers is the only talent that this kind of event affects in this way. I would imagine there's got to be at least like a half dozen more of the tons of talent that'll go to an event like this uh, that struggle with this. Because when you look at the League of Legends World Championship, which is it's the biggest esports event in the world, period. It runs uh, across an entire month. Typically, obviously, when we don't have COVID, it is all over a, a country or region. So there's multiple different big cities there we're going to. Uh, they're filling up huge stadiums. There's tons and tons and tons of games involved in this event. It's a lot of casting hours. And, you know, when he, you know, as I was reading him talking about, you know, how much it turns your life upside down for a month, I immediately thought, you know, what can riot do or what can other developers or tos do to try and mitigate these things and is it simply a uh you know bringing in more talent to ensure that people aren't getting burnt out um my immediate thought uh as well was just the the schedule is so tight and it's obviously it's a very difficult you know we, we talked about balancing acts earlier with uh, with the you know aim assist and controller it's a balancing act here as well because you're trying to run such a huge event in a set amount of time right and it's you're trying to get it done as fast as possible because it costs money to rent out these stadiums to build out all these production setups and all these kinds of things and it's a, a, a difficult thing and I just hope that uh, you know flowers uh, and, and and hopefully other casters as kind of a result of him making this decision uh, making concerted effort to try and mitigate uh, these things and, and hopefully be very cognizant of how much this can affect you. You know, I love, you know, I've been a shoutcaster for years and I love doing it. And I do understand that there can be uh, burnout. You know, I've done before uh, back to back to back best of fives on three days in a row. And that's incredibly exhausting and also incredibly fun. But, you know, when you do so much work in, in such a short amount of time, it can really turn you upside down. So, you know, I wish, wish Flowers the best. Um, and, you know, I will say at one point in his tweet longer, he apologized uh, to anybody kind of disappointed by his decision. And I would say, hey, you don't owe anybody an apology. Uh, you are making a decision to take care of yourself and your own mental health. And I think that is to be commended uh, big time. And I don't think you owe anybody a an apology. I think you are making, you know, the right decision for you. And that's what matters. Yeah, I, I mean, I feel like, I feel like I, I would assume, at least at this point, that it's probably more of a, a personal antidote than sure. it would be anything on the Riot side. Yeah, only, and, and, only because I assume that Riot of any mm -hmm. probably have most of those boxes checked. Because, I mean, I've worked with a lot of talent on that side, of yes. mostly like in the CSGO space, um, personally as like a Blizzard commentator, and then obviously with some Riot talent as well. And it's, it's one of those situations where you're right, right? Like these guys... It's not just, yeah, they're, maybe they're only on camera for 20 minutes at a time or whatever it might be, but it's like the hours of prep work, the mm -hmm. hair and makeup, the, you know, the, the rehearsal that they did the day before, yep. practicing their lines over and over again, the mic testing, et cetera. So they've been there for hours already working on all those kind of things. So there's, there's definitely a lot in the back end, but obviously I do think Riot both compensates and hospitality wise mm -hmm. it's probably top tier and to, and to be clear it's not necessarily uh i wasn't trying to kind of point the finger at, at riot in particular just kind of generally in the in the esports sense but i i completely hear you there yeah but then it, you, you have the whole opposite side of the coin which is like all other tournament organizers and grassroots side which is sure. like no i don't actually have the budget for 14 commentators mm -hmm. every single show mm -hmm. um and no i actually can't pay them the same day rate as a doctor and no i actually can't you know <laughs> what i mean so there's a there's a a lot of yeah. obviously flip on that other end right where you're like okay i have to build the programming this way but then it's like riot's building out the entertainment for a whole world mm -hmm. you know what i mean to like watch this kind of stuff so give and take yeah shout out to flowers good luck dog definitely shout out to flowers hope uh and he did say uh if you guys are captain flowers fans and maybe you missed the announcement he did say uh he plans on sort of doing a co-stream uh, of the event he's going to live on normal na hours but as of right now he's planning on getting up at a normal hour, ignoring social media, and then uh, restreaming a lot of the games and casting over them. So if you're a big Flowers fan and you don't want to adjust your hours for an event that's going to run in Iceland, you can just follow him and watch his commentary on the game. So I think that is awesome. He'll See still get to follow him. Yeah, right. I mean, I'll be likely watching a lot of games live and then taking a nap and then waking up and coming into work. So, <laughs> you know, I'll, I'll figure it out. I watched Worlds in China live, which was 
crazy last fall. So um, I used to watch uh, GSL. <laughs> So oh, okay. Like the old school StarCraft mm-hmm. 2 stuff where yes. you like to download the GOM TV launcher just to watch it. You know what I'm saying? O- OG esports fans represent. Bro, StarCraft fans um, are crazy. And that stuff would like start at 1 a.m. Mm-hmm. So run it up, boys. Run all, it up. All you LCK fans know, know <laughs> what's yes, up. Very to, to an extent. Granted, you still have it easier because you can just go to the LCK stream on Twitch and stuff. Mm. But yes, that's a... Uh, it's a different time. Dedication, for <laughs> sure. Um Big discussion right now. Let's talk about CSGO and Valorant. The uh, Esports Integrity Committee has announced that they have 35 North American players under investigation for match fixing. And they are currently working with Riot uh, for those players who switch from CSGO to Valorant. Uh, There's been a lot of discussion lately as uh, the ESIC handed down a two-year ban to the former coach of Heroics CSGO team, uh, Hunden. Uh, there's been a lot going on there. And, you know, match fixing has been an issue uh, for years. Sadly, in multiple titles, it has definitely struck uh, CSGO quite significantly in different regions over uh, the last five to 10 years. And that's obviously unfortunate. Um, it's good to see that there are uh, bodies trying to snuff these kinds of practices out, but crazy to see this announcement that they have 30 five North American players currently under investigation. And that doesn't necessarily mean that they will all be found you know, guilty of these practices, but that is uh, not a low number to see. It's a very high number. Yes. That's, that's just like, I mean, uh, no one is surprised. Okay. It happens, Everyone's sadly. a giant cheater. It's, it's <laughs> like, oh no. You're all hacking. Stop um, it. <laughs> I, I would love to see a harsher punishments, mm-hmm. even in the sense of, you know, like finding a, a athlete using steroids type stuff right in sure. that sense where it's literally like strip them of all their winnings push legal you know ramifications on them you know what i mean like that stuff has sure. like way more ramifications than just like oh i match fixed fat fixed right it's like every other person in the entire tournament the whole entire tournament's ruined yeah right in that sense every single player all their sponsors all the brand like it trickles like a lot right yeah. so like the you know because you a different team that could have been the breakout performance that could have won, you know what I mean? Like doesn't even get an opportunity in all of those senses. So it's just like, uh, I hate seeing it. You know, it's happened a lot. And I think CSGO is probably the worst. Sadly, um, yeah. Especially back in the day, they had to like really big fiasco. Like originally were like one of the best team of like literally all time. Like didn't even need to cheat, like match fix to mm-hmm. like make like a thousand bucks or something like that. And like they easily would have, you know what I mean? Like become millionaires if they yeah. didn't do that. And that's, you know what I mean? So it's just like, I hate to see it. I, I, you know, I obviously love seeing committees like that even exist and be able to to continue continue to press charges and whatnot. And I'd love just to see the game developers more than it's a two year ban. It's more of like a lifetime across all esports ban because it's like once you cheat one time, get them out of here, like forever. You know what I mean? Like the fact that yeah. you can even match fix in this sense is crazy to me. Like how are they even? You know, it's just like, bruh, I hate it. I, I hate it. I am not as harsh in terms of the punishment like i'm actually not necessarily in favor of lifetime bans for uh first offenses i think for for one thing uh esports is very young uh and not only as as an industry but when you look at the kinds of pros that we have we skew very young um and so i think there's certainly been uh, a lot of issues where players are young and stupid and they do these kinds of things for greed or whatever uh and i think that i would i would hate to see a player make a mistake at 19 that just completely ends their career. Now, there's something to be said about repeat offenders. I am definitely would scale up the harshness on repeat offenders, but I would definitely not want to just completely throw the book at first-time offenders on this front. I think it is definitely an issue that should be taken very seriously, uh, um, but I, I would be a little, uh, a little more lenient on that front. Uh, the one thing I will say, and I do uh, want to clarify, not because uh, I don't think I was necessarily clear, as I mentioned, Hunden uh, at the top was not uh, suspended for match fixing. It was related to abusing a spectator bug and then uh, also sharing strats for his team uh, with other teams. So I do want to clarify that it was not for match fixing for Hunden, um, but just generally on the discussion, match fixing is a problem, and I agree that uh, obviously CS:GO has been plagued by it for a, a long time and it is an issue and I agree with you that I think it's very important that we do have some of these governing bodies coming in because you know I think the 
the history of esports is is really important. Um, you know, I come from obviously a very uh, heavy traditional sports background, and I think uh, one of the incredible things I would love to see is you know we've got things like these these physical locations and these hall of fames for different kinds of traditional sports titles, and you see books written about these players and all these kinds of things. And I hope that 10, 20, 30 years down the line from now. Uh, that esports has continued to grow and develop with different titles, different genres and such. And I would love to see, you know, not necessarily doing it in the same way because I hate, I, I personally do hate seeing uh, esports, whatever, players, fans, uh, staff uh, trying to just do the traditional sports thing for esports. But I would love to see the history of esports whether it's uh, from you know tournament winnings and all those kinds of things, uh, treated with the same kind of reverence uh, and looked back on in the same way that we do with traditional sports. You know, we romanticize uh, the old days of the MLB and the NFL and all these kinds of things in traditional sports. And I think that esports deserves a similar kind of treatment. And I think to an extent, stamping out things like match fixing and treating these things very seriously and trying to get them out of games is very important to the legacy of these games and esports in general. Yeah, I feel like, I mean, I feel like when we're talking about like dishing out punishments and match fixing and cheaters and whatnot, mm -hmm. it, it depends on like the platform that they're playing on, right? Because there's, there's literally been, I'll use like Smash 4 as an example. Okay. Super Smash Brothers 4 for the Wii U, let me tell you, is an entire, <laughs> an entire game, yeah. an entire like two, three years of competitive history is completely fake. Like I'm talking the entire thing was match fixed. I'm talking giant, like the biggest tournaments of the entire sure. thing on the biggest stages were match fixed and trolled and joked about and like some of the worst things. And I'm talking years of people's lives, tournament organizers, commentators, all mm -hmm. these people. And it was all just a bunch of crap. You know mm -hmm. what I mean? So I, I feel like when we're talking about, you know, oh, well, if it's just like a young player doing this or whatever it might be, it's like, I mean, that's fine. But like, young kids go to jail all the time. You know what I mean? Like, sure, I'm just sure, saying sure. it's like, just because they're young doesn't necessarily give them a, a right to literally diminish the integrity no. of, sure. you know, what I agree. so many millions of people spend their whole lives producing and sure. trying to be, become a part of, right? And I feel like it's just really hard to... As even like, I mean, I know as I wish I just had a big old list and like, I, right. you know what I mean? Like, I I love dropping the ban hammer, you know what I mean? Because again, there's there's not a lot of rules. He's it's a very lying. young industry. It's very mm -hmm. hard to, um, you know, especially with games not being built for organizers to really be able to utilize them appropriately. Right? It's not like mm -hmm. we have all these anti cheats and inside on the back end, so we can really tell people playing from home, like what's really going on on their computer, etc. There's a lot of unknown factors there. Um, so I feel like it's pretty important to snuff it out and make it so it really does feel like a grave, grave mistake that can ruin careers. Because mm -hmm. it's like, I'm sorry, if you want to cheat in video games when you're 19, it's sure. like you can just go to college and get a normal job if it's really that big of a deal. It's not like it's going to go on your permanent record as far as an individual goes, but it could sure. if it's the point where you're like actually stealing money from people, which mm -hmm. in these cases, it is what they're doing. They're legitimately stealing money from people and mm -hmm. things like that, so... I don't know. I'm 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 pretty uh, I'm pretty anti. I mean, I know everyone's anti cheaters, obviously, right? But it's like in, in other my, than the cheaters. Yeah, in my eyes, I just think I think more about like the actual organizers and mm -hmm. the broadcasters, the talent, the other players, the teams, etc. Who's just like there's so much competitive integrity there mm -hmm. that it's like to cross that line and for it not to be fatal is True. a little iffy for me. And I, I I think it's a good point. While I while I disagree, I think there's definitely a lot of good points on that side. So I certainly understand that. Uh, last couple things uh, I want to talk about. Let's start with uh, Astralis, one of the biggest esports orgs, especially outside of North America. Uh, they released uh, a lot of financial info about the org uh, earlier uh, or over the weekend, uh, and they reported two million dollar loss, uh, but doubled revenue in the first financial report of 2021. Uh, a quote from the article says, "Astralis." also reported a net loss of $2 million compared to what the organization lost in the first half of 2020, which was just short of $5 million, according to Astralis Group's financial report of the first half of 2021. And while typically we were like, wow, two, they lost $2 million, that's terrible when you consider everything that's gone on and they've uh, recovered as significantly as going from $5 million of losses to just two uh, as COVID 
slowly, hopefully starts to wind down. Obviously, we're not completely done yet. Uh, uh, this is likely not a unique a story unique to Astralis. I mean, a lot of uh, businesses uh, inside and outside of esports, and especially a lot of orgs in esports, are still dealing with the same issues. Yeah, I mean, it, it hit everybody, right? COVID mm -hmm. obviously hurt a lot of cases, especially sponsorships in the sense where mm -hmm. it's like, okay, there's less stuff going on. A lot of sponsors had, you know, less marketing funds available for that year. So, like, there's definitely additional damage on that end. Um, and then just, you know, less tournaments, you no know, less winnings. Maybe leagues got pushed or moved and contracts got changed, but it's not like the players stop existing. And <laughs> so it's not like your your hard costs don't go away, especially as mm -hmm. a, such a large organization has so many players and, you know, team houses and contracts and obligations and whatnot. So uh, it's good to see progress. Sure. Yeah, you know, because, you know, that's why they have sponsors and investment and you know that's why they're a public company and it's hard being a public company in a lot of cases but in these senses it's like we had to go public so we could get the funding right so it's like now you guys see our negative but the negative is you know we're slowing the bleeding down right this is what we're doing to increase our revenue streams etc so it's good to see that um and obviously hopefully them and, and the other esports orgs that are facing similar issues just you know continue pushing forward as we slowly climb back to whatever the new norm of esports is going to look like because um, it's really just about you know them being able to take care of their players yeah. and them making sure that you know they can they keep that internal staff safe and, and funded if you will um, while you know keeping the because not like the operations stop right the team still has to operate yep. all the way across the board and even if the revenue stunts so good to see I'm, I'm glad they're starting to pull it back a little bit but hopefully again you know the like I mentioned the investors and the sponsors tend to float that yeah you know and, and make it so that they can become a profitable company like. The TSMs and the FaZe Clans and things like that, right? I, I was listening to um, just a couple interviews the other day and, you know, about the creation of FaZe Clan and yeah. turning FaZe Clan from just like a, you know, a frat boy house yeah. who has cameras into an actual profitable business, right? And there's, there's so many steps in between those two pieces of, oh, we're an esports org or an esports club, whatever it is that, you know, makes a bunch of content. We make a bunch of money on YouTube and all these other things to actually being able to transfer that into regular income that can, you know, be supported on all aspects of, of life, regardless of how your current YouTube video is doing. Sure. Right? So. Yeah, it's obviously, you know, it's just a tough time. It's a tough time to be an esports org, but uh, glad to see Astralis recovering. And hopefully that is a sign of the esports scene as a whole. Doing, uh, doing the same. So love to see that. Uh, final thing to talk about, let's talk Pokemon Unite. Ooh. Obviously, it's something that Luke loves to talk about. Uh, and there was an article put out uh, titled, Five Things Pokemon Unite Needs to Add to Survive. And I want to run through just the five broad topics, get your thoughts on them, and we can kind of discuss maybe there's some stuff that you want to add. But they started with uh, number five was better patch notes. Number four was more maps. Number three was roll lock. Number two was Nerf Zapdos. And number one was uh, changing held items. Uh, the discussion was mainly held item upgrades are too expensive and makes it feel uh, very pay to win. So just up front, what are your kind of thoughts on that? As I know you've uh, loved playing Pokemon Unite since its release. Yep, yeah, uh, I, I definitely was into Pokemon Unite a lot when it first launched. Yep. You know, I've been, I've been kind of just casually keeping it up mm -hmm. and playing a couple games here and there to kind of see what's been going on. Um, I agree with a couple of those for sure, right? Like when you when you consider having like a ranked mode, which they have, yep. it's kind of annoying for it to just feel like standard mode or mm -hmm. like casual mode at the same time. Like it doesn't really feel like there's any kind of difference at all. So things like roll lock, I feel like is a really good idea because mm -hmm. um, it's so annoying, right? Like let's say me and you queue up and we like want to go bot lane together. And like, even if we like mark our little thing that we're going bot lane it's like but then you get into the game and four people run bot lane just getting griefed and there's no real way to communicate yeah you know with the team and in, in that sense so i definitely think that the lack of communication and the lack of roll lock makes playing ranked even more kind of frustrating than a normal team game would be in that sense um so i definitely agree with that i think the patch notes thing is just a it's just a baby complaint um i, I, mean, I understand where they're coming from but the patch notes are coming from japan so if you literally just go to the Japan patch notes and translate them, that actually says the exact numbers that it changes, all those kind of things. So it's just a just a bad translation. I'm not going to complain about it, okay? It's not that big of a deal. Uh, but I understand what what everyone's crying about. I always post on my on my Twitter when that when they post those. I just post the Japanese patch notes so that mm -hmm. people can just go read the real numbers instead of getting trolled by whoever translated it. Mm -hmm. um, 
So that's pretty funny for sure. I don't, I don't think that's a, a big issue. Zapdos is obviously an issue. I just wish that Zapdos was one different Pokemon. I think they're already working on that. <laughs> but I just wish it was like Zapdos is sick. What put, do you mean? We'll just put other Pokemon in there just so it like feels like a little bit okay. different. So that the fighting is a little bit different every time, right? Different mechanics, sure. like different raid mo modes, whatever it is. Like I feel like such an easy change to add. Okay. Um, map wise, I, again, I just think they could just change the Pokemon out change the color of the map. Like, it, I kind of agree with that statement. I think it's a pretty easy quality of life swaps. Um, but I think just the game at a fundamental level just doesn't really have a lot of growth potential. Mm -hmm. So I, I think it's pretty stagnant. I don't really think a lot of the changes are relevant or matter, to mm -hmm. be honest. Like, I think the game's probably going to stay where it is and then slowly just go downhill from here. Like, I don't, I don't think there's a lot of piece that they can add to bring a real competitive environment to it, I yeah. guess I would say. Like, it's, it, again, it's, it's a pretty simplistic, fun game. You know yeah. what I mean? There's not there's not a lot of direction to go, and if you really if the only intent is hey let's make this game as esports as possible, then sure. But that's never going to be what Nintendo does. So I like the game. I think it's a cool game to, to play and mess around with. I think that um, most of the changes that they want are unrealistic, and we <laughs> we shouldn't really <laughs> expect almost any of those. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, even like Roll Lock, right? Like that's not at all the point of the game. Like, Nintendo wouldn't even support that, like, yeah. in a million years, right? So, if anything, we should just revel in the fact that they're probably just going to keep giving us more Pokemon to play around with, and they'll mm -hmm. probably end up swapping out the, like, the legendary, like, Zapdos and things like that, and maybe give us new maps. But um, I, I, think the, I think the game is fun for what it is, and I don't think we should expect too much more on the competitive side. I, I do very much agree with that last point. I think the longevity of the game does not look the same as a League of Legends or a Dota or a Valorant or whatever. I think it's going to continue to hold on to its most hardcore audience and some of the biggest Pokemon fans that like the fact that they can play a MOBA as some of their favorite Pokemon. But I think it, you know, as the game continues, is going to lose some of the broad appeal as players go back to whatever their other favorite titles are. I think it's still going to continue to be one that, you know, hey, People can, you know, come back and pick up at kind of hey, at, at any time. Came out. Let's mm -hmm. go play Blastoise. Sure. All right, it, that's enough of Blastoise. Yep. I, so I think that will happen, but I think the longevity of the game is not necessarily there. So I would love to see some changes. I'm curious to see what happens as, you know, the game gets more time underneath it. So I think that would be great. But uh, that's going to do it. Our fourth episode here of Eat, Speak, Compete. I hope you guys uh, enjoyed the show. As Luke mentioned earlier, if there's stuff that you guys want us to talk about, whether it's titles, maybe there's some players uh, you want to hear from that you'd love uh, for us to reach out to, uh, please let us know. Luke is uh, at Shimon Heat on Twitter. I am at Kester Yeso. Uh, and that's going to do it. Find us on YouTube or on Spotify and Apple Podcasts. Just look up Eat, Speak, Compete, and we'll see you guys next week. We had a lot going on here at Esports Arena. Make sure to check us out at esportsarena.com to see uh, what we have on the table and hope you guys enjoyed the show. We'll see you guys again next time. See ya.